putting all cards on the table. We are going to hear one, t one last discussion. We are going to hear a live testimony that's uh, truly impressive. We're talking about Walter Hens here. You have possibly read about him in the last few days and the emails that we have submitted to you. It's a man that at 42 years of age, having been happily married and with children, he decided to change his sex and uh, turn into a woman. That was not sufficiently satisfying for him and he went back to his original sex. He has a very intense life, a uh, thrilling life and a story that's always uh, worth uh, recording a movie about and he's going to share that with us. So we greet him and we welcome him with a warm round of applause. Thank you very much, Walter. Thank you very much for willing to share your history. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It, thank you to Citizens Go for inviting me here to speak to, uh, to this audience and to be with this uh, group of very young people. My gosh, all the doctors and speakers, they're all very young. Then they bring in the old man to close it out. And you know, if it were actually possible to just will who you want to be, I would like to be six feet tall, 30 years old, and very good looking. Well, I'm not any of those. I'm 77 years old, not so good looking, and quite short. So, but the truth is that I underwent gender reassignment surgery after starting my life out uh, at the age of four, feeling like I had been born in the wrong gender. I started to identify with uh, cross-dressing, and my grandmother began to affirm me by helping me uh, change genders. She made me a purple chiffon evening dress. And I, what I realize now in looking back, because now I have 73 years of history, of real life experience of dealing with transgender issues on some level, whether it's the experience of being a child who felt like he should have been a different gender or going through the teen years and adult years and eventually undergoing surgery. What I realize is that the worst thing that happened to me was being affirmed by my grandmother in that the idea was that there was something wrong with being a boy. And so when you begin to affirm someone in the opposite gender, it's a bigger picture than that because what you're really saying is there's something wrong with who you are. So how do you fix that? And once that seed was planted in me, I call today the seed of gender dysphoria as it grew, it began to take over my thinking and it began to play in my head every moment of the day. It was like having a radio on that would never stop playing, that just continued to tell me that I was born in the wrong body or that there was something wrong with me as a boy. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if grandma would have just sat me down and said, Walt, you're a very handsome young man. You don't need to change genders. Let me affirm you as a young boy. Let me help you realize who you are, but that did not happen. And it's not happening today. And the result is that I went with these feelings, and again, you have to look back, this was 1944, there was not the internet, there was not doctors like there are now, there was no information. I was dealing with this all on my own, as best I could. I went through my teen years, and I struggled all the time. I was cross-dressing even as a teenager, but I kept it a secret because I was full of shame about having this going on in my life because I didn't know anybody that was transgender. Christine Jorgensen hit the headlines in 1955 when I was 15 and I realized, oh yeah, okay, I guess you can change genders. That was the first signal. And so I began to think that it was possible. But there's nobody around to tell me, no, it's not possible. There's nobody around to say this is absolute insanity. So you move forward. And so I got married and had children because I was not a homosexual. 
I was feeling like, okay, maybe I could solve this. If I got married and had children, these feelings would go away. They didn't go away. I, I developed a successful career. I was uh, an associate design engineer on the Apollo space missions, working on NASA cryogenic connectors, developing specifications for the connectors that would be used on all the Apollo missions. After a period of time, I left that industry and went into the automobile industry and became an executive for American Honda Motor Company, one of the top executives for the company. You see, I was bright on some levels, but I could not really figure out what was going on with me with these ideas about gender and what was going on in my life. And I began to use alcohol as a way to cope with these feelings because I didn't have a therapist, I didn't have the internet, I didn't have these good doctors sharing all this information that you're getting over the internet today. Contrary stories that we need more of. So I went to one of those gender specialists. Uh, in fact, it was Dr. Paul Walker. Dr. Paul Walker had actually been the person who drafted the first international standards of care that eventually morphed into WPATH. And he wrote those standards. He was the chairperson. He was my therapist. I went to him in 1981 at his office in San Francisco. He was an expert. He was the most knowledgeable person in the world. So he was going to, I was affluent enough to be able to go to the best. Here's a guy that I trusted to be able to give me the information I needed. He said, you're suffering from gender identity disorder. But he told me even in that meeting, he said, it's going to be changed to gender dysphoria. But he said the treatment for this is hormone injections, hormone therapy, and gender reassignment surgery. And there's a two-year waiting period that you go through to see if you're suitable for that procedure. I went through the two-year waiting period. At the end of the two years, I was still struggling. He just continued, like Grandma did, affirm me toward getting a gender change. That was the solution. That was the answer. That was the way to cure gender dysphoria, to cut body parts off and fill yourself with cross-gender hormones. That's the answer, right? That's going to cure you. That's going to fix you. Your world is going to be perfect. My, I got divorced from my wife. In 1983, I underwent gender reassignment surgery by a Dr. Biber who had already done 3,000 gender reassignment surgeries in Trinidad, Colorado. I became Laura Jensen. I lived in San Francisco. I worked for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation for the federal government. I had a decent job. I eventually worked for the Postal Service. But I started to study psychology at UC Santa Cruz in California. And I began to crack open books I'd never looked at on psychology. And it became clear to me, I wasn't a doctor, but it became clear to me that this is a psychological issue that's not going to be treated with medical therapies. While no one else could seem to figure that out, it seemed clear to me. Isn't that funny? That was you know, early in the 80s, and today still we're treating this as though it's a medical condition. No one yet today can actually show a medical report. Somebody can come in and say, I have gender dysphoria. There isn't one doctor that can pass or give a test to this person and put it up on a screen and say, oh yeah, you have gender dysphoria. We take it at their word. It's a self-diagnosed disorder. And what we know today is, as I stand here, is this, the procedure failed. I reverted back after eight years of realizing that it's totally foolish, that it's categorically impossible to change your biological gender sex. You can make yourself look different, 
you can fool people into thinking you look different, but you're not. And so today, as I've been studying and writing, I've written five books, and I do a lot of research work, and what I, when I begin to go back and see what's, what has been going on with this, and I first looked early on at the three people who kind of started it in the U.S., Kinsey, Benjamin, and Dr. Money. And guess what? All three of them were pedophile activists. This is the kind of people that were leading the charge in the U.S. on advocating for cutting body parts off and filling people with hormones. How barbaric. It's like Frankenstein when you think about how gross it is to cut people up like they're a piece of meat at the supermarket and then try to identify them in a different gender. It's total insanity. But we sort of walk around and go, well, we don't want to offend anybody. People say that I'm too harsh. Well, how harsh is, is it for them to cut body parts off that didn't need to be cut off? How harsh was it for them to tell me that you could change genders when it's a total lie? How harsh was it that I lost my career? How harsh was it that I lost my family and my two children to this because it's insane? As I looked back, I looked at the first clinic Harry Benjamin had in New York, and there was an LGBT activist endocrinologist that worked at that clinic. His name was Dr. Charles L. Illenfeld. Almost 40 years ago, 1979, Illenfeld, in a meeting not much different than this, much smaller, in Tappan, New York, told his colleagues, I want to warn you about using hormones. This is almost 40 years ago. I want to sound a warning on hormones. He said, I have been working at the Benjamin Clinic now for six years. And I've administered hormone therapy to 500 transgenders who have undergone the gender change surgery. He said, what I've concluded is that as a consequence of helping them change genders, is there too much unhappiness and too many of them end in suicides. That's a guy working at the clinic. He's an LGBT activist. He says, I'm going to stop administering hormones and I'm going into psychiatric care so that I can actually help the people because giving them hormones and changing their genders is not effective treatment. Well, you can dismiss Illenfeld if you'd like, but then you can look at 2004. The UK Guardian published a report that was uh, done for the University of Birmingham. University of Birmingham looked at 100 studies on the consequences or results or effects of doing gender reassignment surgery and hormone therapy. You know what the headline was after they had reviewed these? They said gender reassignment surgery is not effective. That people after undergoing reassignment surgery are traumatized to the point of suicide after undergoing the surgery. Okay, we got Illenfeld saying too many suicides. He said they need psychiatric care. We got a study of 100 studies done in the UK that said it's not effective. And we're still doing it today. I get letters from people through my website, Sex Change Regret, all the time. And you know what the one thing they tell me? Without question, the biggest mistake of my life, can you help me? There's nothing good about this. Short-term gain, long-term pain. Most of the people who report regret and want to detransition or revert back happens between 5 and 15 years. The studies, when they show people the success, they talk early on. They don't want to look at the people 10 and 15 years out. I've had them write me letters 
30 years post-surgery and say it took me 15 years to admit that it was a mistake. There is nothing good about this. We're ruining people's lives. We're doing barbaric things by cutting body parts off and then jamming kids with hormone therapy. I'm here to tell you that it ruined my life. Why do I speak out about it? Because I still get letters all the time from people who need help from around the world. And I do the best I can to help them realize that some things you can't restore. It's a tragedy. And yet we got governments approving it. I want to know those governments who are giving money to help people change genders, are they going to spend the money to put the body parts back on when the people want them to put back on? Are they going to pay the families who lost a child due to suicide a couple of million dollars because the government made a mistake in saying we should be doing this? I doubt it, huh? So when we think about this, realize that today, from 1979, when Illenfeld talked about too much unhappiness and too many suicides, the one key thing in 2018 is, today, there's still too much unhappiness and too many suicides because it's not working. It's not effective. If, in fact, the suicide rates were dropping as a result of this, I would go silent. They haven't changed. Young people between the age of 12 and 24 are attempting suicide at a rate of 50%. 25 and above at 40%. If there's any other medical procedure that you know of that people are advocating for, that people are attempting suicide after having the treatment at 40 and 50% rate, what do you think would happen to it? It would end immediately. Not so with this because it's political. I don't know whether we should go back and continue to listen to Illenfeld, the UK Guardian, or some little old man like me. But I just wonder how much information do you need to take action? We can sit and listen to all of the wonderful speakers today. None of them have anything good to say about it. It's barbaric. You don't change genders. It's cosmetic. It's like going to the Mardi Gras every day. It's not real. There's nothing real at all. And yet, we keep listening. We keep hearing the stories. And we keep burying these people who are committing suicide. We need to start taking some action and actually being effective because we've been totally feckless in stopping this total madness. Thank you. Yes, please, could you come so that they can set the microphone on you? Your for, your, for your testimony. Um, well, if someone on the floor wants to make any question, please uh, write the paper and I will, um, I will make the question for, for Walter. Um, I have a lot of questions because I have read a lot of things uh, related with your life. Uh, it's a very um, passionate life and very intensive, very hard, okay. and also very difficult. Um, you, you spoke on your grandma that dressed you with that uh, dress, and it was yeah. like a secret. What happens, that was when you were four years old, I guess? Yes. What happens when you, when you were growing, when you were an adult son, or a, 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 um, and, and then a young person, an adult? How was your relation with your grandmother? What happens then? Well, uh, once my parents found out that um, 
My grandmother had been dressing me. They didn't find out for two years after it started. And once they found out that what grandma was doing, they wouldn't let me go to grandma's house anymore. Uh, so um, that sort of broke that relationship up. Uh, you know, I saw her uh, with my parents, but she never, after two and a half years, didn't get an opportunity to continue that. And I didn't realize when I was 9, 10, 12 years old uh, that I was going to be 77 years old and sitting up here talking about it either. So. Pero nunca, usted nunca... But you never, during your teenage years, during your youth, you never talked about it with your wife, with your grandma, sorry? You never talked about it with your uh, grandma? And never with your parents? Um, very little. Yeah, it was sort of a taboo. You didn't talk about it. And then you thought that when you get married and you will have sons and you have a professional career, you will forget everything, all that. I, why, don't, why do you think that you don't forget when you have life is speaking to you, you are successful and so on? Um, you know, you, you, you know the, when I was going through this, I didn't know what the consequences were going to be. You know, I was uh, really, at, at the age I was going through, I was somewhat of a pioneer. There weren't many people around. And so uh, I was totally going through this totally on my own. So I thought the things I was doing was probably going to help me, but they weren't. Usted habló con su mujer de... Did you talk to your wife about, about, that, um, about cross-dressing, the fact that you were cross-dressing? Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Walt? Can you hear me? Yes. No? Right. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Walt? Can you hear me? Um, what is happening? You are not completely happy and that you need... Yeah, so... So, uh, with my first wife, you know, I told her that she knew that I'd been struggling. And so, um, we'd been married for 17 years, but, uh, you know, we just decided that... Um, without any other contrary information. The only information we had was that you needed to have the surgery to make this go away. So we got divorced and I had the surgical procedure because there was no research, there was no opposition that was known. There was no internet, as I say. I was flying solo. And the only information I had was from Dr. Paul Walker, who was an LGBT activist who Anybody who went to him and said that they were struggling with gender identity disorder would get approval for surgery, even if they didn't need it. Obviously, I'm one of them. I read that before your divorce, you were in a center, a sex reassignment center, and that you escaped that. You never did that there. And you talked to your wife and you said, I'm, I was about to do this. So I get the feeling that you were in, in a situation where you were anguished and you were asking for a lifesaver that you couldn't find. I, when, in 1981, two years before I had the procedure, I, I went to Dr. Walker's uh, Dr. Biber's office to have the surgery, and um, when I was there, I realized that um, I still wanted to fight this. I wanted to overcome it, but I didn't. I didn't have any information as to how to fight it. I was fighting the shadow that I I couldn't punch. And when I he I saw Dr. Biber, he told me to go to the hospital. The surgery was to happen the next day. I gave him the initial seven thousand five hundred dollars as a down payment on the surgery, went to the hospital. I walked into the, the entrance to get all the blood tests. And as I walked across the room, I just sort of broke out in a sweat. And I did an about face and left the hospital and said, I can't do this. I've got, I've got to tell, I've got to go back and get help. I told my wife when I got home that I wanted to somehow figure out how to overcome this. But even uh, being married and with my wife and everything, there was just no information. There was no, there was no guidance that, 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 that was helpful to me. You also say that when you were 42 years old, after your divorce, after, your, after losing your professional career, after losing everything, you decided to be happy somehow, and you decided to... to undergo this sex reassignment and you had some 
time of joy that somehow just was going back to childhood. But then you asked yourself, why did I go through this change? So what happened during that, that, that time when you were happy and you dressed like a girl and you used makeup and so on? What I tried to do was once I went through the change, I, I tried to uh, then affirm myself. Everybody's talking about affirming. I wanted to affirm myself. I wanted it to work. And so I thought, well, if I had a good job, if I presented myself well as Laura and I passed as Laura and, and I was doing all of these things uh, socially, I had my own apartment, I had a car, I had all the trappings, what looked like an effective life. But when I started to study at UC Santa Cruz as Laura Jensen, I began, as I said, to open the books up and realize that from what I could see was that this, this was far more psychological, emotional, or a sexual issue than it was a, a medical issue. So uh, I realized then that trying to treat it medically was going to be ineffective. Usted, eh... According to what I read, you have been the victim of many different things. You're a psychologist, a gender doctor who recommended you to go to undergo surgery, and who then said, uh, who who then said that it was a mistake. And your father, who was very, um, very harsh on you, and your grandmother, who aff affirmed your feminine side. Uh, what is your feeling about all of this? Well, uh, uh, Dr. Walker, who approved me, I did confront him later a couple of times, and, <clears throat> and he admitted that uh, he made a mistake, and that he admitted that uh, they really don't understand all that much about gender dysphoria, that they just have to kind of go with what the person says is what they want to do. And so they're approving people based on what the person's feelings are, not on any objective or, or good psychotherapy. In fact, most of the time they ignore the psychotherapy. And my father, of course, when, uh, when he found out that um, I was cross-dressing as a young boy, he was uh, uh, very upset, as a father would be, and uh, he began to discipline me heavily. Uh, but I didn't blame him for that. Uh, I was just as confused about it as he was. You also have a very, very dramatic conversation with your son uh, when you decided to reassign your sex. You, you have good relations now with your son? I do. Uh, my, the relations I have with my kids um, is very good. And so um, some of the things get restored. Obviously, um, my changing genders was very difficult on my children. And I'm sure that they still, well, they may not tell me, I'm sure they still suffer uh, in many different ways, but we, we do communicate with each other, we get together, and so um, it could never be as good as had I never had the surgery. Uh, you can see that difference. Uh, it, there's some harm done to all of us. They ask me, how do you advise um, a child should be treated in school if they have gender dysphoria and he suffers because his colleagues don't understand him? Because currently they are being treated with their f the sex they feel. So if he feels like a girl, he should be treated as a girl. How should he be treated in order not to hurt his feelings but help him at the same time? be dealing with uh, kids changing genders in school. This should be done by the parents at home and done through psychotherapy. The school is not the place to indoctrinate kids into changing genders or giving them books to show them that they need to change genders or that there's all these things going on. Parents need to take the lead in dealing with these issues. The parents know what went on in the home. The parents know if the child's been uh, harmed sexually or emotionally. And so the schools, to me, should completely eradicate and stop any of this gender-affirming stuff. I am not in favor of it one bit. But if a child, but if a child... En su opinión, si un niño... But if a child decides that he is a girl at school, then they should treat him or her as a, as a boy? If, the, if there's a boy coming to school as a girl, I think there should be um, a good uh, intervention psychologist or psychotherapist that's on staff 
that can do as I do with everybody who comes to me and asks me for help. I go back and look at what the family environment is like. I go back and look at what experiences they've had in their childhood, in or out of the home, and 100% of the time, I found out that there's some experience, some, something happened to that child. And if we just understand that when, once we identify what happened, whether it's a serious loss or whether it's a sexual molestation, um, what we can do then is identify it and then begin to treat it. But we don't need to give them cross-gender hormones or affirm them in a different gender. We need to deal with what caused them to not want to be who they are. We've talked a lot about suicide, the high rate of suicide amongst, amongst trans people. But uh, many people think that those suicides are caused by discrimination, by harassment, because they have not been integrated, they weren't understood, not because of the sex change in itself. What would you say to them? Yeah, the truth is that it is not bullying, uh, it is not discrimination, it is not the lack of affirmation that causes kids to commit suicide. What causes kids to commit suicide is they are psychologically unstable, unfit emotionally, and need psychotherapy. We know from suicide.org, who, who connects all the dots on why suicides occur, 90% of all suicides occur because of untreated psychological disorders, most of them depression. Why is the kid depressed? We're, we need to treat de uh, depression with depression, not with hormone therapy and cross-gender ideology. Eh, usted dice, usted dice, en, en su página web eh, hay varios estudios. On your website, uh, there are several scientific studies, and one is a bibliographical review that says uh, that 20% of people who undergo uh, sex change surgery want to change. But what happens to the remaining 80%? If you have 20% who want to change genders and you have 40% of them attempting suicide, then we already know that at least half of the people are not happy with their gender. And we know that people won't attempt suicide or commit suicide if they're really happy with their life. We, only, we know that people who are attempting suicide or don't want to, uh, who want to revert back are people who are very unhappy. There is one question that says the following. This issue is clearly political. So the question is why, what for, what is in it for them? Who's making the money? Are we uh, treated as uh, uh, human uh, guinea pigs? Who's uh, collaborating with this? All this structure that has forced you to live a extraordinarily difficult situation. There is a political current behind them, behind this, and it's putting children in an extreme situation. What for? Why? When, when you look at who is the power base behind gender ideology, these groups are the ones with the power. They are the ones with the money, whether it comes from the government or whether it comes from George Soros, who has spent hundreds of millions of dollars to promote this, this, this ide ideology is to destroy man and woman marriage, destroy the family, and once you destroy gender, you, can, you have no basis for man-woman family. So this is a, a, a definite political attempt to completely eradicate the basis for man-woman marriage and gender, because once that's destroyed, you have no foundation. If you destroy gender, you destroy family, and therefore you destroy society. Is that the approach? Uh, y para qué? And what for? Why? Political power. Political power. Guess who's in charge? Guess who's getting the money? This is the political power. And the people who are in power are these people who believe in this ideology. Even though there is absolutely no proof that it is successful, in fact, everything points to the fact that it does more harm than it does good, we have a political group of people who are promoting 
changing genders that's causing people to attempt suicide, and yet they're totally blind to it. We've known this for over 40 years. They are asking me what would you have needed to hear at that point, at that point when you were just about to change sex, to not do it. What words, what advice, what conversation, what kind of friend would you have needed at that point? What can we say to those people who are in the brink of making that decision? What I needed was a Walt Heyer standing up in front of me shouting, don't do this. This is absolute insanity, and understand that you cannot change your biological gender, that this is only uh, a, a fabrication, it's a Halloween mask, it's totally false, that you don't change anything. And so I needed someone to speak the truth. In fact, one of my friends, Bill, who had been one of my friends for many years, I told Bill when I was Laura, I said, you know, Bill, you're going to have to call me Laura now and give me all the right pronouns and, and you're going to have to do this right, you know. And he says, uh, he looked at me and he says, right pronouns, huh? He says, why don't I just call you wacko from now on? <laughs> I have a, a question in English. What did you say to teenager who was said by doctors that all his problems would disappear with a sex change. Yeah, get a different doctor. <laughs> change of doctor, not of sex. <laughs> um, and also, what do you say to all politicians who see the sex change as the only option. Of, of course, we could change the politicians, but unfortunately, they are all politicians, at least at Spain. Well, <clears throat> obviously, the politicians who are approving this have not read the studies that I've read. Um, I believe if they were to read the studies, some of them, uh, people in this room have written, Michelle and other people, these, there's so much information out there that is contrary to approving, guiding, supporting, or giving credibility to this. No one should be giving anyone hormones or surgical procedures to change their genders. It is absolute, total madness and insanity. What was the consequence of the hormone treatment uh, for you? in your personal case. And therefore, why wouldn't you recommend that? Why is, uh, what are the secondary effects, the collateral effects? 25 years since uh, I reverted back. So, uh, you know, much of the, um, the hormone therapy stuff, to be honest with you, uh, all it did was make me look more feminine. Uh, it gave me a feminine appearance. It made me more passable. In fact, as I detransitioned early on and was still dressed up in, in men's clothes, people would say, yes, ma'am, can I help you? So there was a, a tremendous feminizing effect to the hormones that took years uh, to, to go away. So uh, it's very disturbing that uh, we have people who advocate for doing this and realizing I've worked with people who've gotten brain cancers from hormone therapy, and many of the people who do undergo this cross-gender hormone therapy will go to a doctor, get hormones, and then they'll send to Canada or they'll go to another doctor and they're taking three times the amount of hormone that they need and oftentimes they get blood clots in their legs. I've had them with brain cancers. Uh, it's not good. You have also talked about suicide quite a lot and I think that you were also having suicidal thoughts at some point, you finally didn't do it. So what saved your life? I attempted suicide. Uh, I attempted suicide with an overdose of cocaine. Um, and um, it didn't work. Uh, Fortunately. But uh, I, I tried to overdose on cocaine one night and um, my, my chest was actually, uh, I, it almost, I think almost exploded from the amount that I took, but I became very sick after that. And uh, that was the point at which uh, I began to um, 
to realize that um, I needed to do something different, and so my life began to sort of take change, but it took several years. Allow me to ask you some personal questions. You decided to go back to being a man. You fell in love. You decided to get remarried. But you also told your wife, I'm a broken man. How did that... That acceptance happen, the acceptance from your wife, how did she, uh, did she accept it? You can look at me and see why I'm so handsome and so wonderful. <laughs> Anybody would fall in love with me, so th that answers the question. <laughs> and I'm also very brilliant. But I read something beautiful that your wife said to you. In reality, we are all, we are all broken somehow, right? He said we're all broken, and uh, we all need the redemption of Christ. And uh, we've grown together in our faith, and we've been married now for 20 years. Thank you. <laughs> One last question. You've had a very bumpy life, a complicated life. You said uh, before you would have liked to live someone else's life. And you just shared a testimony, and I guess uh, this is not easy for you to do. So do you have an explanation as to why all this happened to you? Why you had such a roller coaster type of life? Do you have an explanation for it? Well, uh, when Grandma began to cross-dress me, um, that planted the seed of gender dysphoria. And then when my uncle, uh, when I was eight or nine years old. Uh, he was a teenager at the time, and he began to sexually molest me. So I think when you have someone cross-dressing you and you get sexually molested, uh, you end up with, uh, as a young person, with a very complex issues. And this is 1947, and I'm all alone in trying to deal with them. I did the best I could. And, you know, thanks to the good Lord, here I am at 77, able to talk about it. So my life got turbulent because I was affirmed as a young boy at four and because I was abused sexually early on and became very confused about who I was. And I didn't much like being the boy who was being sexually abused and dressed up as, as a girl, probably to try to escape the pain that I was feeling. El anterior ponente Gabriel Cubi asked the relationship with Jesus. I know you have a Christian faith, but I would like to know what, what what's the role that the Christian faith uh, play when you were uh, in the in the hole and they rescue. Ah, the rescue. Well, um, I think you know uh, the Lord never left me. I left the Lord, and so. Um, <laughs> When I began to uh, start working my way back to dealing with these uh, issues, I sat down with, um, and this is the last question, right? <laughs> uh, I sat down with a uh, Christian therapist and we uh, began to talk about my life just as we are today and all the painful things that had happened. And so as we went through these things, I had written them down on a yellow lined piece of paper and we went outside his office and put a match to them and torched them and let them go away in the air. And he said, let's go back in and pray. And so we went back into his office and I was not, he was a, got one of these people who would pray for hours at a time. I was a person who would pray for a minute at a time and be done with it. Yes, but he wanted to pray and so, <laughs> I went back and, and began to uh, pray with him. And during that time of prayer, which I had already confessed to the Lord that 
uh, I was living, I had lived my life wrong and I wanted to be redeemed and restored and I had been working toward that end. During that prayer, uh, with my eyes closed, the Lord came to me in white. He was reaching out to me and I looked during this prayer and I could see myself as a little baby wrapped in cloth and the Lord picked me up. I could see that it was me and he held me in his arms and the Lord spoke to me and said, you are now safe with me forever. And at that point, I was redeemed and restored and have been ever since. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord. Thanks. Thank you.